So a very good afternoon to everyone and welcome to ISIS um, webinar series. Today we will be talking about um, the tectonics, tremors and tempers of Southeast Asia politics and the evolving COVID-19 normal. Today we will have a very special guest, Dr. Bridget Welsh and um, followed by a discussant by our in-house um, expert, uh, Mr. Um, Harris Zainul. So um, today, um, Dr. Welsh will be presenting to us how the crisis of the COVID-19 will reshape politics in this region. And more specifically, she will elaborate on the COVID-19 political fault lines, changing public perceptions, and also sources of tensions in the region moving forward um, while we're fighting the pandemic um, in the region and also beyond. So Dr. Bridget Welsh is currently an honorary research associate with the University of Nottingham Asia Research Institute, Malaysia, and she's currently based in Kuala Lumpur. She's an author and an auditor, uh, editor of numerous books, reports, and articles. So um, she is a force to be reckoned with. And um, our discussant today is our very own Mr. Harris Zainal, who's, Zainal, who's an analyst at um, ISIS Malaysia. He is now looking into the consequences of misinformation and disinformation on democracy and societal relations. And also he's looking into Southeast Asian and Malaysian politics as well. So before um, we move forward, um, this is a very timely issue as we all know, but it is not without um, its sensitivity. So moving forward, I would really appreciate if we're all aware of that so we can have a very productive and tension-free um, discussion on the topic today. So um, Dr. Bridget Welsh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for joining today. It's really an honor to speak at ISIS, uh, and I am please forgive me in, in advance if if my internet doesn't always function uh, as well as it should. I went, I spent two hours at Cellcom this week trying to up it up, but we'll see how it works in this process. And thank you very much for spending a bit of time. I've got about half an hour, and I've presented I think enough material for about three. So please, uh, um, I will try not to. I probably will not be covering everything in my slides. Uh, but I want to sort of uh, uh, look and, and begin a conversation with people in this, in this webinar about how we begin to think about how politics is not just changing globally, but also in the context of Southeast Asia. Now, so far in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, COVID-19 has about 60,000 cases in Southeast Asia. There have been about 1,800 deaths. Huh? And these have led to sort of very uncertain trajectories. The way I've organized this conversation is three different levels of analysis, but also three different ways of looking at intertwined processes and relationships. To begin the conversation, I'll talk about things that I see uh, that are really important, at least from my perspective, at the global and the international level, the big major shifts that are taking place. Because I think that we have, we have to acknowledge that the problems and the issues that Southeast Asia are going to face are coming very much, a lot of it from the outside, outside shock these big shifts that are taking place. Then I look at how they move into the, the drivers um, and also how it's uh, affecting politics within the region itself. And given the time constraints, I may end up focusing on the first and the third and a little bit less time on the second, um, given the fact that I think that there'll probably not be enough time to cover everything. But I'm going to focus specifically on what are, what are the kind of things that are coming first in the, in the context of the discussion. And so these three intertwined processes begin the kind of conversation. But given the fact that there is always shortage issues of time, I'd like to sort of <laughs> start off with where I want to end up. Um, and let me start, let me give you my conclusion. Huh? First of all, I don't expect any immediate changes in government. <laughs> that those that do happen in the region are likely to happen as a result of oligarchic competition and elite conflict. And in the two countries that I'm focusing on here today, I think both Singapore and Myanmar are looking into very comfortable electoral victories. But the political pressures for both of these governments 
will come after the elections uh, as a result of the same pressures that the, the rest of the region is facing in terms of inter-elite conflict and leadership challenges. The second major trend that I see is an authoritarian, uh, authoritarian uh, uh, organization. I expect this will deepen, and it was happening before COVID, uh, but it's a deepening as a result of the products of weak response and capacity. Uh, it's not that, that democratic or authoritarian regimes are handling the crisis in better or, better or worse ways in the region, but rather that there are the weak responses encourages more authoritarian reaction. And in fact, what we're seeing in the immediacy is that some incumbencies get a boost of support, but ultimately incumbents, both Democrats and authoritarians, will face some sort of backlash, especially as the COVID-19 crisis moves into the economic dimension. The third conclusion that I make is that we're really seeing that the threats of stability are coming from outside of the region. And they're largely driven, not necessarily by the public health dimension, by the economic dimension of what's going on and the leadership responses to the economic dimension. And as a result of the fact that this is a global crisis in terms of the economic slowdown with limited leadership to handle it, I think there are gonna be specific spillovers within the region itself because you're dealing with a new global environment. We need to go back to the first slide, just a moment. I'm just giving the conclusion to the tech guy. Uh, so can you go back uh, for a moment? <laughs> Uh, thank you. The third uh, kind of conclusion is that the nature of politics uh, uh, is changing and is, is shifting. That means the nature of elections, how campaigns are going to take place, the views and trust of government, and of course, uh, changes in social and political trust. And that governments may not fall right away, but the views of how the people think about politics is really changing, and it's changing pretty fast. There is no longer the kind of the government knows best perspective. Uh, and the relationships uh, within society have both a combination of positive civic mindedness, as well as a kind of new uh, deepening issues of fear and that and insecurity that's taking place. And these two things will be very challenging to master ahead. Okay, now I'm here at the slide that this young man has kindly uh, put me on, the tectonic shifts, these bigger uh, issues that I think are happening. And the way that I organize this conversation uh, in terms of the big global shift, uh, that I see as around things that are changing in terms of practices, problems, policy approaches, and shifts in global power. At the practice level, we see that fear is really becoming something very, uh, it's always been a major feature of regional politics, but it actually, during COVID-19, it's become very deeply personal and some things that people cannot control. Um, and, and then as a consequence, the way to channel the sphere is actually uh, is a, is, is also shifting. It becomes a reservoir for political actors to mobilize. Uh, and we've seen after crises this happen at other times in history, such as the 1930s. So this becomes a point in, at, in, at a reservoir for xenophobia, for racism, and for a lot of irrational behavior. But I think it, uh, we're going to see, we're seeing globally, and we're going to continue to see potentially in the context of Southeast Asia. To say, on the other side of the, uh, of the spectrum, also seeing intensive and increased civic mindedness. People are looking out for their neighbors in unprecedented ways. And of course, this, in some ways, we're seeing social trust uh, deepening, um, a, a, in, especially among those that you already have social networks ties to. And this I will, uh, will describe later is that I think what we're seeing is that this is a, a force for new political forces to emerge. In terms of practices as well, we see new changes in elections. Uh, we're gonna have new forms of uh, globally of electronic and in-mail elections. Um, we're gonna have an e-election in Singapore. Um, and of course, this will also change campaigning. It's also the, changing the way data has been monitoring as well as, and it provides new threats to the security of elections because of the way the process is, is evolving. So we're going to see these th types of engagement shift. And in terms of globally, we see that the COVID-19 has been an enhancer for, pro for problems of inequalities, intensification of the ideological polarizations that exist within societies. And of course, it's brought attention to the issues of competency. Uh, and this is really an important shift. There's also been changes in terms of policy that has been that has involved issues of involving uh, instead of hard security, there's greater attention to human security and a different conceptualization of human security, via that in areas associated with um, uh, changes in practices of human rights, 
focuses on social safety nets. <laughs> um, and also there's been a shift in terms of policy approaches in terms of digitization, data, uh, you know, technology, the way people conceptualize this is about science. And this comes in, I would say, into regional politics, as I will describe a little bit later, in encouraging the emergence of third forces. Um, and this is I, it's also connected in terms of approaches has been a securitization. So keep in mind that three governments, Cambodia, Thailand, and the Philippines have declared emergencies. Uh, and, yeah, and Indonesia and Myanmar are relying heavily on the military for implementation for COVID-19. We see a kind of new era for civil military relations. Even in other countries, they turn more to security forces, uh, including the police, than they had in previous times. And so this raises the changing relationship of militaries and police globally, but particularly salient in the context of Southeast Asia. Finally, as in terms of the tectonics that we're seeing, is we're seeing changes in terms of deglobalization. Now keep in mind that a lot of the negative forces pushing authoritarianism were coming from those who didn't benefit from globalization. But now what we're seeing is a process of deglobalization. And so this has had an impact on other parts of the society, people who benefited from globalization. So it's almost what I call like a double whammy effect. And so people who expect to travel can no longer travel. The middle classes and everything else will change. Huh? And I think that is a very interesting kind of transition that is happening in Trump, where we're having the people who are, who are affected by globalization more intensely affected by these processes. At the same time, people are now having to wrestle with deglobalization. And finally, and this is something I'll spend a couple, uh, a little extra minute on, is that I think we're dealing with a global leadership bank. In contrast to many analysts who say, you know, the, the U.S. is gone and the China has come up and China is now the global power. And of course, this view is predominant in the context of Southeast Asia because China is so close. I would say that we're in an era without any global, clear global power leadership. We're seeing multiple responses and multiple models. And I think this is something that uh, is, is, is very challenging to manage the crisis. Uh, and one of the reasons why I say it's not China, despite the fact that they have uh, uh, capital advantages and private and, and, and state capital, they have technological gains, is that I think China is, is, is not yet um, uh, willing to accept the cost of being the hegemony, the global hegemony. At the same time, there's also serious trust issues that China faces. Not to say that other actors like the United States didn't face trust issues, but, they, but there was still a willingness to, to have a, a greater leadership in terms of uh, the cost of, it, of, of that. So we're not, for example, seeing the Chinese floating the renminbi, for example. And of course, their, their, their diplomacy is, is a bit ham-fisted. So this also limits their capacity to help to uh, embrace a more um, global role at the very top, although they are making important to do that, but that, I would suggest they're not quite there. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those reasons in this as the conversation moves. So what we're seeing at the, at the global le level is a kind of sense of a normalization of uncertainty, diversity of responses without global leadership for a global crisis. And this has a spillover effects within the context of the drivers, the tremors, the things that have, the impact of these shifts that, that are happening within the region of Southeast Asia. We have clearly seen a U.S. decline and retreat, and we can go into this in more detail, um, but what I would like to say is that uh, just a few key points that I think people are recognized, but it's sometimes important to, to, to drum in, and uh, in that Trumpism is here to stay whoever wins the election in November. Uh, he's the man in the White House, or he's the man leading the One America media outlet. And the legacy of what he's helped to create in America is going to be something that is going to be for, for some long, a long time. Uh, the United States, whatever role it takes, is going to be one that is shifting in terms of internationally and domestically. Um, and it won't be something, you know, if somebody new gets into the White House, that there's going to be a shift. The decline is going to continue until there is a readjustment within the context of the United States. And that's not likely to come, it'll never come back to the role that it had before. Um, now, of course, everyone's focusing on the elections, and I'm happy to speak those about that in more detail. Um, of the three scenarios that I see, a Trump win, a close call, or a Democratic blowout, uh, there are different factors that contribute to both of these factors. 
and it's now still six months out. I think the key issue that will determine this will be the economy and, of course, uh, the issues of turnout. But I can talk more about that in terms of the specifics uh, because I want to get closer to the conversation about Southeast Asia. But I wanted to emphasize this big issue of tremor because this has implications in the, from the context of Southeast Asia. The other thing I would suggest that China is more of on a pause. What, a lot of attention is focused on China's foreign relations, but a lot of enough attention is how COVID-19 has had an impact domestically. What we've seen for COVID-19 is that the impact of over-centralization of power, the, the problems of inequalities within China, and that I think in some ways the overextension of Xi's leadership has actually ha created a, a, a need for China to look inward. This is part of why I say that China has to make, have, make some adjustments inside and deal with the political ramification before it moves. Yeah? Now, <clears throat> In the context of Southeast Asia, and as we look at these drivers, we have, this is, oh, the next slide, sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is the changing information about US-China um, uh, power relations, which we can see that there are very big differences within the region. This is the latest wave of the Asia Barometer sur Survey, so you can glance at that. Let me, I'm now at the next slide, uh, which is the tremors, and looking at some of these factors that are happening. New um, oligarchic pressures, uh, new issues of religious mobilization. Just, I'll just pick up on a few because I know Harris is going to talk about other things. So we see a really a weakening of ASEAN. We see a, a shift in terms of uh, uh, oligarchic competition. This is really an important driver of what's happening in Southeast Asian politics. There's li uh, the crisis is going to create limited patronage. And this is going to, in turn, create a, a move towards the sale of assets, of government assets. And this is going to exacerbate tensions where there is a lot of oligarchic competition. And this, of course, I think will be one of the drivers of instability in many of the regimes in the region, and particularly those that have comparatively weaker leadership that don't have a lot of public legitimacy. We're also seeing drivers of xenophobia and racism within the region, not just in the context of foreign workers, but particularly uh, interesting anti-Chinese sentiments. Uh, many of you may have followed the Halamara um, uh, protests and the burning of the factory in Indonesia uh, uh, last week. And then also in, Cam in Myanmar's election campaign, there is clearly all over Facebook anti-Chinese sentiments and uh, you know uh, that are happening already, uh, which are really changing these some of these factors and so drivers. Other key tremors that are we're seeing that are that are coming out of COVID-19 is a weakened opposition. Oppositions were weak beforehand, but they don't know how to respond to COVID-19 because they have the, their role. As a, uh, is actually not being uh, clearly defined. And that I think is going to be very interesting as it moves forward. Uh, um, we're also seeing changes in terms of government re relations and perspectives of government in terms of how the government is being trusted or not trusted. Uh, uh, for example, let's go to the next slide. Maybe. <laughs> next slide. Oh, yes, this is the slide on, this is the slides on government per perceptions. You can see this, the, the perceptions of the economy in many countries in the region. Uh, this is positive views of the economy. Look at how low they were pre-COVID. Can you imagine what they're going to be like post-COVID? Now, only 14% of Thais had a positive view of their economy. This, of course, is very sharply different than places like Vietnam and, and, and the Philippines. Look at Malaysia, only 22% felt had a really po had a positive view of their economy. Uh, and this survey was conducted last year. So uh, in the Mal Malaysian context, very weak numbers on economic perceptions. Next slide, please. This is the trust and leadership to do the right thing. Here we also have considerable you know, faith in the paternalistic state. But again, the numbers vary, right? Vietnam's response uh, and uh, to COVID-19 can be seen in part as a, as a trust that they have in the leadership being much higher. Uh, uh, and even though COVID-19 is not, response has been very lackluster in Myanmar, we see also a situation where the responses have also been, there's still considerable trust among large segments of the society. Um, and a, a little bit less trust in places like Thailand, uh, uh, for example. 
Okay, so let's move. Uh, I didn't cover everything in that section, but I know at the time I'm moving now to the conversation of, um, of the kind of what's happening in the region. So can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, oh this one we'll skip through. We can look at this later. This is about inequality. Okay, so what we're seeing here within the context of the region, some broader changes. Huh? Uh, Globally, the region is really struggling how to deal with multiple, leader, multiple leaders, but in fact, no leaders, a global vacuum, and managing uncertainty. At the national level, the drivers are going to be how the incumbents and military power seem to have gained. But at the same time, they've also taken higher risk by being on the front line of the crisis. And so the longer the, the crisis continues, the more the military and incumbents potentially will have a political backlash. We have intensive oligarchic competition and in many places weakened leadership, even in places where they had very high uh, support, such as that of Jokowi in Indonesia. The, the, we don't know yet in terms of looking at how the, the political dynamics will shift in terms of the depth and the scope of the crisis, but I think this is going to be a very important driver. We're seeing changes in views in politics uh, more, global, more regionally about how people are saying they're sick of politics, the discussions of politicians. They want people who are competent, not focused on themselves. And in some ways, in some, many societies, uh, you know, such as Thailand, there's almost like a depoliticization. Uh, many people think, for example, the, the views of what's happening in Singapore, for most Singaporeans, they couldn't care less about what's happening in politics. They care more about what's happening in their daily lives and whether or not they can get about their daily lives. Um, we're seeing trends for uh, that the, the adopting of democratic values has been on the decline. This was pre-COVID, and we expect that this can actually be enhanced during, co during the post-COVID environment. And we see considerable groups of anger and others. Uh, and of course, I'll let uh, Harris have the talk about the conversation of um, these particular areas of the ASEAN. Let's move now to, um, because of time constraints, I'm going to go to the, the discussions of Myanmar and, and Singapore. This is, okay, this, let me get through these, some of these slides. This is a very interesting slide. Um, it's a particularly interesting slide for Malaysians. <laughs> and that is, this is a slide of where we ask whether or not the, they should reduce the number of immigrants in your society. Look at the number of people who think that they should do that in the context of Malaysia. 86% of Malaysians say they want, they want to get rid of immigrants. And a very considerable number, 70% Indonesia. Uh, uh, in places like Vietnam and Myanmar, which traditionally have very negative views of immigrants, and open, whether or not they're from Cambodia, whether or not they're Rohingya, there's actually a lot less, a lot more support for immigrants. This is a very interesting issue uh, in terms of looking at kind of the, where the sources of xenophobia may come from. Next slide, please. This is a very interesting slide. We asked uh, uh, questions across the country about looking at the issue of democratic deconsolidation. Essentially, how strong are people's views towards the property? So we, and here at this questions we asked are our citizens, are, are you prepared for, uh, for democracy. And look at the numbers. In the Philippines and in Myanmar, a strong majority think that a large share of their population are not ready for any democracy. Uh, uh, and even in, in places like Malaysia and Vietnam, it's very large, it's numbers, it's at least uh, uh, almost 40%, 40% um, in Vietnam and 37%. So these are some of the kind of supporting things to, to, just to illustrate some of the things I'm trying to explain. Next slide, please. Okay, we have, according to my clock, about seven or eight minutes, am I correct? Yes, okay. So let me, go, let me spend about a few minutes on both countries that I want to, to focus on. All right, Myanmar is, is heading to an election. It was supposed to have an election November, December. Um, right now, despite the government of officials saying that the election will be held this year, there are going to be problems to do that from an administrative point of view, particularly the, the viewing of the list and, uh, and also preparing the electoral roll because of some administrative hiccups caused by COVID-19. Myanmar has only officially 180 cases, but it also has the lowest testing rate across the region. Uh, and so we'll see how this evolves. Huh? 
But what's going to happen, however, is that the form of the election is going to change. It's going to be very much media driven um, in terms of uh, traditional media. And of course, it will be a Facebook election. Um, and it's interesting that Aung San Suu Kyi has already moved on Facebook, which she didn't do for previous elections. And of course, she's on the news every day. As in the case of Malaysia, you see uh, uh, Dr. Noor Hisham, uh, Dr. Hisham here. Uh, well, in, in the case of Myanmar, you see Aung San Suu Kyi on daily updates on a regular basis. Um, the second thing that's really shifted during COVID-19 is that the military has actually become much stronger, or at least is projecting itself within the context of being acting and solving and addressing issues of COVID-19. And we have released today, which you, which you can look on the ABS World website, a very interesting report on Myanmar, uh, which uh, helped with my author, with my team, on what's happening in Myanmar. And one of the things we found is a new base of support among young people for the military in the contemporary sense context. So the military support has actually increased. We're also seeing a rise of ethnic conflict. And keep in mind that in 2015, 2020, it's already more conflict than there was in 2015, this last election. But during COVID-19, fighting has increased. Although there's been a call for ceasefire, fire, this has not really resonated. And so COVID-19 has been used as a distraction. And keep in mind, the use of ceasefire by Myanmar's military is actually a tactic for them to split the ethnic groups and actually uh, any, usually leads to more conflict, not less, in contrast to what the word ceasefire means. So we're seeing this uh, escalating, and I think it's going to extend into the election period. All indications, all analytical modeling that I've done and others have done clearly point to an NLD victory. But this is a victory uh, dependent on Aung San Suu Kyi herself, not her party. Her party is extremely weak. There is no clear leader, leader after her. And this is a problem for Southeast Asian politics more generally, is we don't have enough young leaders in the region uh, to offer alternatives to some of the older ones. But it shows what I was trying to describe earlier, an incumbent advantage. We're also seeing a changing in the nature of campaigning, which I was also describing earlier in terms of the shift um, in terms of how people will have to rely heavily on Facebook. But the opposition is extremely weak. Um, it's polling extremely low, low numbers, um, but the opposition is not really the USDP because that's not really a very effective party. The opposition is the military. And this is where it, it is actually shifting in terms of the scope of how they may offer, and they're probably going to be introducing alternative parties. Huh? Uh, the, the new format of the election will actually disadvantage ethnic parties compared to other actors. Um, we're also seeing uh, in the election already the China factor, uh, which I think compared to the China factor in Malaysia and Indonesian elections will be a more, much more significant because the China's role is much larger and it has become polarized along political lines. Um, as a major issue, and it has local resonance in parts of Myanmar and certain constituencies. It's also going to be a Facebook election because of the level of penetration, uh, almost 80%. And we see targeted campaigning, aka kind of the Trump type of campaigning against certain actors, which we'll see a lot of potential hate speech and also calculating use of social media uh, so it's going to be a very different form. We're not going to see the rallies and we're not going to see the kind of the showing of force or the kind of the sense of performance. Um, and so we will have a different feel to it. Um, and keep 40% uh, of the electorate in Myanmar is also going to be under the age of, of 35. So it's going to be a very interesting process. We have 15 million new voters coming into the election. So uh, it COVID-19, I think, will in some ways, deepen the polarization, but at the same time, it will also lead to an NLD victory, uh, but a victory that will be one that will be a very much more difficult campaign than the previous one with much more negativity. Let's turn now to the next slide, and that is the, can the election in Singapore. So again, the timing and the form of the election is changing. The timing was supposed to be already, but in fact, actually, uh, they're waiting for the opportunity to hold the election. That they're looking for June or July or maybe early September. It depends on the rates of infection from COVID-19. Keep in mind that Singapore has the highest number of cases, but they've also had smaller intensive, intensive testing. They passed a bill last week in Parliament for an e-election. 
This is, interestingly enough, Lee's exit election. So they want to have him do well. And, uh, and it is a test and, and during COVID-19 of the 4G leadership. What we're seeing in terms of initial polling is that uh, there's traditionally been in context of Singapore emphasis put on competency, um, but there has been some liberalization in a large part of society. Much of the reporting has been on issues of, of liberalizations and inclusion, but in fact, the polling still weighs heavily in the context of the PEP, which won 69% in uh, 69.9% in, in the last election, and I project will probably uh, have, have can do continue to do very high, um, uh, depending on how the timing moves in the election. Part of the reason why they're going to do so well is the opposition has is extremely weak. There have been problems of cooperation and personalities, and even though it was seen as the opposition was much stronger, new actors had emerged, uh, and the, and they were gaining gaining traction during COVID-19, some of the traditional problems of opposition actors have actually uh, come to the fore, which have to do with personality and different sets of tactics and, nar and narratives. For me, when we look at Singapore and post-COVID-19, the problem is not the election, because elections with the PAP are pretty much seen to be a, 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 you know, a very confident that, that particular party. But we'll see elite competition after the election and finally the issues of the economy. And this is something I think is very important to look at. <laughs> um, and Singapore uh, has, has actually, I think, quite resistant to reform. One of the things that I skipped over, which I think is useful to, the, to bring back now, is that I think COVID-19 is going to change the regional pecking order uh, the way it has already been changing. The, the relative comparative advantages of a Singapore or Malaysia or, an Indonesia, uh, Malaysia or Thailand will become less. And we are now seeing the real winner of COVID-19 politically and economically will be Vietnam, in my view. Uh, and I think Singapore will have really face the music post-election in terms of wrestling with its election. Let me close. Uh, so the next slide, please. All right. So let me just to emphasize that I see weakened incumbents, but not necessarily immediate elections. I think that would also be true for some of the people who have turned in here to, ask, to want to ask about Malaysia. I think that's probably the case as well. Um, there are going to be pressures short term at the elite levels. Now, the places that I look the most closely in the region at the elite level pressures are Thailand and uh, Malaysia. Uh, as opposed, although there is oligarchic competition in many parts of the region as a whole. Huh? Um, we see an intensity of the economic crisis. Now, most indications that it's going to be very, very bad. <laughs> and this is, and, and as it, it's going to be some time before that sets in, but it won't be that long before the political fallout starts to emerge. <laughs> uh, but again, incumbents still hold the advantage because the alternatives are comparatively weaker in many places. Um, even if you talk about an opposition in Indonesia, it's not, it's really on the fringes, not within the center because of the way that the, the opposition is more cohesive, the government is cohesive of bringing more consensual actors inside. Um, we're going to see negative impact for democracy, uh, uh, but these have been going on going for some time. Uh, I think that we're going to see reactions uh, uh, the incumbency and crisis response will be, I think, irrespective of the type of system, if you're in a more democratic or a more authoritarian system. So, for example, Hun Sen will face challenges if, the, if he doesn't find some sort of economic challenges, despite his move towards a more less democratic system. The dem democracy is, a, is a, a threat when it's completely working. And this is what we're seeing straining, strains on this in places such as Indonesia. And, of course, we've seen this for some time in the case of the Philippines. We're, so we're going to have, and this is the thing that I think we'll, we'll, I'll close on because to me is the, most in, the more interesting ones, we're seeing a change relationship with government. People are looking for people who are problem solvers. There are new forms of mobilization. People are looking at issues of civic mindedness, a new youth mobilization, different ways of engaging politics. Uh, so when we think about the opposition in, the in a traditional way of kind of political parties, this, there are going to be new civic society forces that are going to emerge, and this is going to change the nature of pressure points of how politics emer evolve in the future. And they're going, to they're going to participate in politics in very different ways, because they won't be able to do the same degree 
of protesting on the streets, uh, or they'll be protesting through social media, uh, they'll be protesting through pressure points and uh, opening up exposés. Uh, and these things have happened, but they're going to intensify and take on slightly new forms. New forms. I apologize if I spoke too quickly uh, and tried to rush through some of the, all of this. I offer some ideas that I think are shifting, and I look forward to Harris's remarks and the conversations and questions from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bridget Walsh, for that very rich um, presentation. Um, before I pass the floor to Harris, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to remind the participants that we have two ways of asking questions to the speaker and the discussant. Number one, you can um, go and type in your um, questions on the, um, in the Q&A box, and this is situated below your webinar screens. And the other way, I, I think it's a much more preferable way uh, to the speakers and the discussion, if you were able to raise your hand so that you can verbally live um, um, ask the questions directly um, to them. So it will be a, a less lonely process, I feel. So um, let me pass the floor to Mr. Harris Zainol for his um, point on the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Juita. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And also, uh, before I begin, a big thanks to Dr. Bridget for her very comprehensive presentation earlier. Um, so for the next 10 to 15 minutes that I've been allocated, I'll try to add some value to what Dr. Bridget had comprehensively presented on earlier by, and I'll limit this to, I'll limit my thoughts to five areas. Um, the first two concerns ASEAN and how it's going to be like in the post-COVID-19 world and the remaining three points of the five will be focusing on uh, politics in Southeast Asia. Um, so the first point, what are the effects of COVID-19 on ASEAN as a regional organization? Um, here, I, relative, I generally agree with what some observers have argued that ASEAN has failed to meaningfully respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, despite the pandemic itself being transboundary in nature, ASEAN was generally quite meaningless in trying to manage how borders were, uh, the closing of borders were, managed, were done among its member states. Um, on a related note, uh, five months in, since the start of uh, the discovery of COVID-19, it remains incredibly difficult to locate uh, the successes of ASEAN thus far. Um, and the problem is this, with the achievements being so hard to find, a case, a really persuasive case could be made against ASEAN uh, essentially being without impact to the ordinary person on the street. Um, adding to this is also how with COVID-19 and the uh, resultant bans on international traveling, uh, the middle class, the group that generally benefits the most from regionalism are now unable to tap into its benefits. Uh, with that being the case, arguments about how COVID-19 could strengthen nationalistic sentiment at the expense of regionalism could hold more weight today. Um, as we enter into this new normal, uh, ASEAN member states really need to start figuring, about, figuring out what it wants of the regional organization. It's been more than uh, five decades since its uh, formation and they really need to also uh, reflect on how genuine they are about ASEAN being people-centered and people-oriented if its uh, effects are not felt by the ordinary man on the street. Um, my second, the second point I'm going to make here is about the re wider regional dynamics that uh, Dr. Bridget roughly touched on earlier uh, regarding ASEAN's relationship with China. Um, here, I first want to highlight how China has, uh, as we all know, has been proactive in employing what is known as pandemic diplomacy, where Beijing is sending various uh, personal protective equipment, PPEs, to the various ASEAN member states. Um, and I agree with uh, Dr. Welsh's point earlier about how China suffers from trust issues. And I say this because despite the efforts to generate goodwill, these efforts pale in comparison to Chinese actions on two fronts. And these two fronts mainly center on uh, resource sharing on the Mekong River, which affects the mainland Southeast Asian countries. And the second front is the South China Sea dispute with the maritime Southeast Asian countries. Um, the point 
here is that despite all of the rhetoric about how China and ASEAN are good friends and whatnot, an argument could be made that despite the uh, pandemic diplomacy that they are employing today, ASEAN's relationship with China in the post-COVID-19 world would still be fraught with challenges. Um, but with that being said, it also does not mean that the Southeast Asian countries can afford to ignore China either, um, especially with what uh, economists are now warning that a recession is upon us. Uh, it must be remembered that China is the largest or one of the largest trading partners of all Southeast Asian countries and trade with China will prove critical in the months to come as Southeast Asian countries uh, struggle to rebuild their economy post-COVID-19. Um, on the third point, uh, I'll be discussing about regime stability vis-a-vis -vis, uh, COVID-19. So this looks into the political implications of the pandemic on Southeast Asian countries. Um, and again, I agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Welsh had mentioned earlier about how the public health crisis in the form of COVID-19 has allowed governments to consolidate power. Right, uh, especially governments with more authoritarian tendencies and the consolidation of power has been quite obvious here. Um, but the flip side to this is that while the government might have a bigger role and might have more power today, at the same time, COVID-19 could also weaken this government's grips on power. And this is especially the case for countries that are semi-democracies in nature, where, regime, where the regime derives its stability from performance legitimacy. Um, and I say this because performance legitimacy would uh, be harder to achieve with uh, the economic implications of COVID-19 settling in and as the pandemic drags on. At the societal level, these implications uh, could include things like undermining the unspoken social contract present in many of the semi-democracies whereby people agree to tolerate a more repressive government in exchange for uninterrupted economic growth. And we see this in countries like Myanmar and Cambodia, uh, Malaysia previously, and also to extension Singapore. Um, with regards to politics, a uh, badly performing economy would also affect the ruling coalition's ability to maintain its patronage networks that are crucial to cement its support among the political elite. Um, but to be noted is that even if the uh, government will be able to manage to distribute government contracts towards its patronage networks, uh, public, the public would react in a much more negative way due to how the COVID-19 is uh, affecting them personally and with the ordinary man on the street facing an, a very uncertain future in the post-COVID-19 world. Um, but having said all that, um, COVID-19 also presents a kind of litmus test for some of the Southeast Asian governments in the sense that if they are able to prove that they can handle the pandemic adeptly, like we've seen in Singapore and Vietnam, for example, then popular support for these governments will definitely increase. Um, my fourth point is on how accountability and oversight mechanisms have largely been ignored by a majority of the Southeast Asian countries in their fight against COVID-19. Um, we know that uh, almost all of the Southeast Asian governments have adopted various policies in order to combat COVID-19 and really no one is doubting the need to uh, legislate or regulate here, right? But the question that needs to be raised is what are or what were the oversight mechanisms ensuring that these policies are proportionate to its aim? With parliamentary sittings across Southeast Asia being patchy at best, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Welsh earlier, uh, parliament oversight in many countries are unable to function as it should. Uh, and without this oversight, there's a lingering question of how sure are we that the measures introduced today under the guises of uh, combating COVID-19 will be rolled back once we are able to put the virus behind us. And this leads to my last point, which touches about uh, the role of the media. With parliaments unable to sit, uh, due to either the COVID-19 or lack of political will, the clampdown on the media that we are seeing across Southeast Asia has raised a lot of concerns. Uh, this is because we know that the media acts as the fourth state in a democracy and a watchdog for public interest. Um, 
So if in the event like we see today where parliaments are not able to exercise its oversight functions, then the media needs to fill the shoes as best as possible in the name of public interest. Um, but rather than empowering the media, we have seen opposite measures being taken in a few countries. For example, in Thailand, uh, Prime Minister Prayut had invoked emergency powers that allows him to censor or shut down any media outlet as deemed necessary. Or in the Philippines, uh, with the franchise broadcasting license by ABS-CBN being allowed to expire, which uh, critics are now claiming that is a direct move to censor the free media in the Philippines. Um, related to the freedom of media is the how the clamping down of media freedom has come hand in hand with a more restric restrictive environment for free speech. This restrictive environment largely results from governments with author authoritarian tendencies suppressing free speech rights on the basis of wanting to counter COVID-19 false information. The problem here arises when governments use this legitimate aim of countering false information on COVID-19 and conflates that with, with measures to silence criticism against the government. We see this in multiple countries, but uh, one of the examples I just want to mention here is Indonesia, where according to a telegram which, was, which provided law enforcement guidelines for the COVID-19 pandemic that was signed on 4th April, it basically said that the police's uh, cyber patrol will monitor, one, the spread of coronavirus-related hoaxes, uh, two, online frauds regarding the sales of health equipment, and these first two are legitimate aims, right? Um, the problem comes when they include the third element here, which is anti-government and anti-president smears. This goes against best practices uh, in more prog progressive democracies, where it's a given that those occupying uh, public office ought to be more open to public criticism. Um, of most concern here is that if you are found guilty for anti-government or anti-president smears, will then be charged with Article 207 of the Indonesian Penal Code, which provides an offence for insulting an authority or public body. Um, so I'll sum up my uh, points today with two thoughts. Um, the political trends that characterise post-COVID-19 Southeast Asia, or the new normal that we are now, is not new. Rather, they are a continuation of tendencies from before. The countries adopting authoritarian and or repressive measures today did not become so overnight. Rather, COVID-19 has provided a useful quick lift to justify greater consolidation of power. Um, the second point that relates to ASEAN is that the regional organization needs, uh, is in dire need of fresh thought leadership of how it wants its future to be. Um, the question remains unanswered about how can it be that ASEAN proclaims that it is people-centered and people-oriented, yet its actions are not felt by the ordinary person on the street? Uh, with that, I conclude my remarks for now, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Haris, for that uh, very insightful view, for sharing with us your views. Um, before I open up um, the floor um, for, uh, for Q&A, um, let me just remind the participants that you can use the raise hand functions if you would like to verbally and directly ask uh, questions to our um, speaker and our discussant. And uh, if not, you can always opt to type in your questions in the Q&A box. And uh, you can also rate uh, the questions uh, which you think are interesting to be posed uh, to our um, speaker and our discussant today. So let me, um, let me start by um, looking at the raised hand function. We have one um, person, we have two. Um, two people raising their hands. No, it went to one again. So let me invite, um, okay, I'm so sorry. It seems that no one wants to ask to you directly, but then um, let me um, ask my uh, co-moderator, Mr. Kelvin Chang, to moderate the questions in the Q&A box. Okay, uh, so we have six questions in the Q&A. Um, since there are no raised hands, I think maybe we'll take three first, uh, the top three. So I'm going by uh, the amount of likes, democratically. So um, 
Top questions, uh, Dr. Stephen Wong. We have two questions from um, uh, Dr. Stephen. So the first question, there are those who would differ greatly on the impact of COVID on centrally planned economies, such as China and Vietnam. Those with the most patchy and irresponsible responses have been precisely democratic ones. First question. So I think both these questions are directed to uh, Dr. Welsh. Second question from Steve Wong. Um, with the prospects of economic meltdowns to different extents, do you foresee unprecedented social unrest? So maybe we'll, we'll answer these questions and then we'll go down the list. Uh, Dr. Welsh. Yes, thank you for not putting too many on the table. Uh, when you're on this new format of speaking, you forget things like a pen. So let me, let me go back to, let me ask the first question, let me answer uh, that to Stephen's first question. I think it's really not about democracies or authoritarianism in the sense of assessing the responses. Yes, we do see trends for democracy, trends for authoritarianism, which we've spoken about. But in terms of the responses, I think we have to look more carefully at, at certain aspects of whether or not you have a functioning, good public health care system. <laughs> Uh, in, the, in, the, in the process, the use of technology. So one of the advantages of a China and a South Korea um, uh, with both very different types of systems has been really very intensive contact tra tra tracing mechanisms using algorithms and science to be able to do this, right? So it's use of technology in, in this process. Another key component has also been social, been government trust. Uh, and some of that, so it's not really whether or not it's a planned economy, but whether or not there's trust in government. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons I showed you one of those slides about different level levels of trust, I think that these things come in there that way. This doesn't mean, however, um, that your point of your question, which is that democratic countries uh, and responding to public pressures and responding to kind of opening up the economy somewhat earlier and more irrationally from a health point of view, are not real ones, uh, but we are, we're also seeing authoritarian governments, op some authoritarian governments open up uh, depending on the context. So such as the not outside of Asia, we can see that in the context of uh, uh, Singapore opened up too quickly um, in this context. So we see that outside of Asia in a place like Hungary, uh, for example, which is seen to be more authoritarian and democratic, but also uh, authoritarian, democratic elected, but also uh, increasingly authoritarian. So I think it's, 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 I don't think that the use of, uh, of uh, these labels, democracy and authoritarian, is, is clearly the, the main um, uh, divider. I think there are multiple sets of factors that come into play. Um, this doesn't take away from the lessons we've learned in the context of Vietnam or in China. Um, I, of these two countries, to me, I, spoke, I focus more on Vietnam um, where there has been, uh, in a sense, a, a less intrusive mechanisms. Uh, uh, and I think there has been, well, there are still real serious human rights violations in, in Vietnam. There has been more trust in some of the information compared to that within the context of China. Uh, but we're still very early on that they've controlled some of, the, they're now opening up the borders with China. Um, and so there's, concerns that there will be a, a potential second wave uh, and we'll have to see how this it evolves there. But I think of the two examples that you look at, I think that Vietnam strikes me um, more positively. Uh, but I also look at other positive examples, um, such as South Korea, such as Taiwan, which are democratic examples, um, which have, have some of the other elements that I spoke about, government trust good tech use of science and technology, a more interventious type of things, trust building communication. Um, uh, New Zealand is another example um, in that context. So the second question moves to the area of uh, the issues of social unrest. Now, I did talk a little bit, and again, time constraints, but I did discuss the importance of, of these two, the shifts in emotions and how they'll contribute. In this. And then I talk a little bit about the issues of the existing inequalities and how we're going to see new sources of displacement that come from uh, the context of COVID-19. So 
we're still early on in this process, but, the, but what we're talking about is a much larger reservoir of discontent than arguably that we've seen in a long time in South Asia. I mean, I would say even now, if we compare this crisis to that of 1997, 98, 99, it's a, it's a bigger reservoir because um, you're not just talking about people who are in economically poor or on the digital divide or are facing, but you're also talking about a middle class that is disgruntled because they're because of the process of deglobalization. Um, so yes, I do see protests taking place, but the problem is that I don't see them necessarily taking the same form that we've seen in the past in the sense that we, we don't necessarily, we may not have mass people on the streets though. We may in some countries, and we've already seen that in Indonesia, and we would, could see that in Myanmar, and we could see that in Cambodia, uh, and we could see that in, uh, in places like Thailand, uh, in the Philippines, uh, especially in local areas. But we're also seeing, I see, uh, uh, really the, the, the area where there's a lot of social discontent and has been in using the social media. One of the interesting things has been this kind of greater scrutiny by society and greater angst and anger, and some of it takes the form of hate speech, some of it takes the form of greater accountability. Um, and you know, governments have been forced to change their responses. And I think, for example, Malaysia is a good example of that. So when they, make, they send out an ad that involves uh, a new program that, that encourages uh, women to behave in a certain way. Social media had massive social response, but the unrest did not take the form of, of direct confrontation with the government that was violent or in the uh, physical, but more through kind of a social media mechanism. Uh, so we're going to see these combination of different sets of mediums. Um, but but the, the, the anger and the frustration is very real. Um, and uh, my concern, however, is not necessarily uh, at the, po the point where it, it, the governments begin to turn back the social arrest, unrest against each other, to pit actors amongst each other to fuel sets of conflict. You know, we've got two countries in the region that there are significant conflicts going on, or three or four, we can argue, the Philippines, Thailand, Malay, um, um, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, and Myanmar. And Myanmar was the most level of conflict in terms of fighting and others. We can see uh, escalations in all of these key conflict zones. We see, against social arrest being turned against different uh, actors. Um, I, I can say, anti-Chinese sentiment within the issues of racism. And this is a global trend, but it, it has resonance here. So, and one of the things I had on my slides that didn't speak to uh, uh, um, enough was the issue of how, you know, if the traditional forms of opposition party politics change, right, which they are, right, because you don't have the same nature of mobilization and you have weaker opposition. So people turn away from existing channels of conflict, but alternative channels of mm. conflict. And they turn to organizations like religion, uh, that religious groups that many of which would like to take advantage of this. Uh, and I think uh, not all because their religious groups is a big spectrum. I'm talking more about extremist groups that, that want to uh, uh, galvanize. And, and, the, and keep in mind, even in the more authoritarian regimes, religion becomes a vehicle for political mobilization. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, the, you know, what I look at and think about it, what's going to happen in Indonesia is how religious groups are going to mobilize and that are already there, that are more, that have been in the political spectrum using protests and others to try to use this as a mechanism for them to gain political ground. And I think as one of the excellent sessions earlier on uh, here at ISIS, uh, Aaron Connolly spoke about how uh, you know that Jokowi's response to the conflict was a response was a product of politics in in many ways, responding to Islamist parties. I think that we still have Islamist groups, parties that want to mobilize and and take advantage of this and the, and and weaker social state uh, social responses. And, and the longer the crisis that moves on, the more this becomes a reservoir for more extremist groups to take action because the other mechanisms are not as functional and are not as dynamic.
Okay, shall we take uh, more questions um, from the Q&A box? Because I don't see any raised hands here for now. So, Kelvin, back to you. Okay, so we're moving on the list. We have uh, Mr. Wing um, asking about, uh, on the point of global power vacuum, are we seeing a sign of new emerging global power such as Australia? So, um, Maybe we'll take two. So the, the first question is on the global power vacuum and are we seeing a new emerging global power? The next is from uh, Mr. Ku uh, asking about the new government in Malaysia and whether or not they will be impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of the uh, you know, fiscal responses and ability to mitigate the effects and will, these, um, will, will the pandemic have impacts on the stability of the new government in the next two years? So um, maybe we can start with Dr. Walsh, then Harris can comment. Thank you very much for these very good questions. So the first question has to deal with the issue of global power vacuum. Uh, I just don't see Australia filling that vacuum, uh, although I think it is an important middle power. But I think there are going to be many middle powers uh, in, in the globe. Uh, it, there's going to be many examples, um, New Zealand, in some ways, uh, South Korea, um, Japan. Um, so we're going. We're but in terms of yes, they have some resonance. But I think uh, my own sense is that Australia has the same issues that that Singapore does, which is to change its economic model um, in such a way that it can move into a different direction for a new post-COVID environment, dealing with the issues of digitization, the changes in the supply chains. The, the, and I think there's going to be put a lot of pressure financially on keeping the, the mechanisms in place that they've offered financially, keeping people, paying for people to stay and work. Um, so I think Australia is going to face some, some inward orientation, like a lot uh, compared to some of the other middle powers as I move forward, for, as I move forward. And I don't think that Morris's leadership um, quite had, because of the polarization, even within Australia, quite has the kind of um, legitimacy, or at least the kind of the, the strength to kind of be outward oriented. Uh, I think a lot of the issues that are being affected are being are still being played within the domestic environment. But I'm sure there are people among here that may differ with me um, in that context. Uh, now to turn to the issue of Malaysia. Now, I, I spoke earlier about processes that I think are very important. Uh, and those processes have to do with oligarchic competition, they have to do with uh, the issues of legitimacy of governments in terms of they also have to do with the issues of being able to mitigate the responses or trying to uh, deal with the effectiveness of social safety nets and managing the crisis. I think Malaysia, uh, Malaysia's government is in, facing a very difficult challenges, uh, in part because it doesn't have an electoral mandate. Uh, and this would be true of any government. And I think it's the similar issue is that of Thailand. It doesn't have an electoral mandate that people trust in uh, because of the way the process was carried out, uh, even though it was technically, it was elected, but the elect process was very was significantly challenged. Um, I think that uh, in the case of um, Malaysia, this government wasn't elected. And so it's, it's coming into a situation from behind um, and so you've got, like, like in the United States, the way you've got a third of, of a society that support the government very strongly. Roughly the same as, say, Trump, all right? Uh, so these are the, uh, the core base. And then you have a third who actually really can't stand it. Uh, it's a vitriol type of reaction. Um, and, that, and so you have these two different poles, which is, is, is polarized. And then you have 40% that lean in different directions based on the context. And the conditions in place in Malaysia will, condition, will, will create leaning among the public. And, and it will be difficult. So the government will have to turn, as other previous governments in Malaysia have done, uh, to turn to try to shore up the government by, by focusing on the elite. And this will alienate large sections of the population. And it will also be a, a, a problem of oligarchic competition. And, it, and given the nature of the fragmented nature of the coalition, the coalitions, uh, uh, what you see is a situation where there will be instability. Uh, and I think this will be a very, um, 
challenging environment for any government at any party. Um, but uh, there will be a situation where uh, that, that neither that both the different types of coalitions would face these instability issues because of the actors potentially pulling out or the leadership squabbles that exist between among them. And I think this is true of both coalitions within the Malaysian context, one more than others, but definitely uh, elite competition. So the essence of it was, is, is that I, you know, I do see, I'm not sure it will get to two years if the, the government lasts or not. Um, and, and I think that uh, this is, but it could last to three years, uh, but it would be still a very weak government in this process, which is a challenge that uh, because of the way the government came in and because of the environment that it's facing. And so that a lot's gonna come down to the, con the contestation at the top. And what I do see this done happening is that it favors uh, the, in the previous incumbent before night 2018 um, and, and from a process uh, because of they have, the, uh, the largest political party, even though it's a much weaker part political party, and they have the closest tie to their political base. Uh, so I think it's going to be a very interesting trajectory ahead, and one that is not that is going to be very challenging uh, for people in society to deal with the, the normalization of coalition politics, the normalization of instability, uh, and you will have uh, escalation. Uh, around the not only at the elite level, but it will also provoke reactions within the society itself. So it's not going to be easy. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bosch. So maybe uh, Harris, you want to comment yeah. on the second question on the stability of the, the, the new government? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, just, just to add a little bit on what uh, Dr. Welsh had uh, elaborated on earlier uh, on the COVID 19 impact on Malaysian politics. Um, Two quick points, uh, and both resulting from what seems to be the razor-thin majority held by the Perikatan National Government. Um, the first really relates to the um, incumbent's ability to manage patronage networks. And I mentioned this in the uh, discussion points earlier. As long as um, political payoffs can continue to occur, then um, the incumbent government would be, be able to better manage and hold on to its uh, thin majority um, the second point relates comes from the same idea about this razor thin majority held by uh, the Perikata National Government in the sense that it is now perceived that the government is fearful of parliament and it needs to be emphasized that while a lot of policies have been introduced since uh, Malaysia experienced its first COVID-19 positive patient to today, um, there's an inherent limit in the kinds of uh, policies that we can pass without parliamentary approval. And if I understand this correctly, one of the main uh, considerations when it comes to fiscal, the ability to provide sufficient fiscal response is our debt to GDP levels, which uh, is capped at 55%, if I'm, remembering, if I'm remembering this correctly, and it's hovering about 52% right now. Um, so yeah, just my two quick thoughts on the matter. Thank you. Okay, um, I still don't see. I just to speak to, can I speak to Harris's point? General, I would make a more general comment that if one person, if one has a majority, one tests it and shows that one has it. I'll leave it at that. Right, we have one raised hand and um, I will now uh, give the floor to uh, Akta Zainuddin to ask the question. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Great. I'm from the National Defense University, and we, the defense community, the latest buzzword amongst us is national resilience. And we measure national resilience from the theory behind national power, of which has four elements, which is economy, politics, technology, and finance. Um, now, both of you uh, touch on these elements of national power. Uh, if COVID-19 uh, has an impact on the region and the globe, uh, uh, on global economy, and, and, and if your theory about uh, the political scenario uh, going through uh, change and challenges, um, uh, are we... Are you really saying that we are um, 
going into a doom and gloom um, scenario where systems and institutions will fail, uh, hence national resilience will um, drop to zero and all hell will break loose. Um, are, are, you, are you really saying that we're coming to that? Uh, is this to me? <laughs> Um, I didn't say that at all. I, I'm saying that there are conflicting processes that are going on. I would say that um, uh, I do see at the political and the elite level intensive competition. Uh, it doesn't necessarily extend to the institutional level. I think that, you know, what we're really, one interesting things about COVID-19 is that we're, that there is quite an interesting, different response and capable response um, by many of the civil servants to the issues at hand. This has been most obvious to all Malaysians in terms of the Ministry of Health's response. Malaysia's resilience in terms of issues of public health have been pretty impressive, and I would say impressive globally uh, as, well region, as well as regionally. So I think that there, you know, there is a distinction between looking at politicians and political contestation and governance and institutions that are actually in governing. I mean, the military yep. and, and, the, and, the, and the public health sector have really done a very good job. And they are much, you know, often one of the things about people who study Malaysia or study Malaysian politics is that, that, that the politicians have, the personalities and individuals have, have, have overshadowed the issues of some of the, of the institutions. I think, yes, there are some institutional weaknesses, and, uh, but there are also some very important institutional strengths. The biggest issue, however, is, is how to navigate and to create reforms to implement some of those, go, those to address the competing coming challenges ahead. You know, there are real issues involving uh, sort of strengthening the social safety net, there are imp improvements within governance. Some of these yeah. take political will and civil servants, many of them who see the problems, uh, uh, want those problems to be addressed, are, have a real challenge of being able to, to find the context to implement them. Others, uh, in some ways, don't, don't want those. They prefer to have these things uh, stay the same. So it is a real, uh, there are other mechanisms within this context. The other thing that I've said positively, Akhtar, which I think is important to highlight, is that, that there is uh, you know, a changing nature within Malaysian society. Uh, you know, politics traditionally, for example, is, has been always described within a racial narrative, for example. But what we're seeing now is, uh, uh, you know, people who are not interested, they're interested in just people getting the job done. People getting, there's a sense of competency. And there has been shifts that have been ongoing, looking in kind of national identity. We see if, if I had a, a Malaysia-specific discussion, I would have showed you some other slides that talk about uh, that the interesting dynamics in terms of inter-ethnic trust at the local level. So I don't, I think it is a, conf it's a, con it's a conflicted process. Uh, um, and I, and I don't want to, to give you a suggestion in anything that there is uh, any sense of gloom and doom as you is the phrase you there. I think it's going to be challenging. I think it's, and there are people who, and there'll be, because of the nature of polarization politically in Malaysia, there'll be some people who will be happy and some people who will be very unhappy. And this is part of the, and this is something that is one of the, the issues of trying to work the middle ground, to change perceptions, to build bridges. Um, and what, what has happened is that some of those bridges that were built in 2018 have now, those bridges have broken. And it's very difficult to rebuild those up again. It doesn't mean the same elements that are in the society that are the, that want a different society, also want a society that, uh, uh, that, that actually has has a different form of resilience um, and strengthen that resilience in terms of diversity orientation. Some aspects of reform aren't there, but it's going. But it is going to be. Uh, it's not a linear process. Um, and I do. Uh, I have to be frank with you at a certain level, Akbar. That I see the challenges ahead as tough. Uh, and and I and I think that that is one of that. And I don't think that Malaysia is alone in that. Uh, I think that you know. The, there's many, many regional neighbors as well um, in that context. But I do also think that in fairness, and I, and I would like to emphasize that point, is Malaysia does bring considerable things to the table that some of the other countries don't have in the region, such as a stronger institutional capacity. Although uh, some people would argue that it could even be stronger. But still, it is a much strong, it, it, there is considerable strength. Thank you. Um, Harris, would you like to add on your thoughts? 
Oh, I'm not on mute. Um, yeah, generally I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Bridget's uh, reply to the question about how institutions are faring. I also agree that while things are not necessarily the, uh, well, it's not necessarily the sunniest days we've seen in Malaysia, they're definitely far away from uh, doom and gloom as well. Um, I agree also on the point about the importance to make the distinction between the ministers who are the political arm of the government and also the uh, institutions, the civil service, the rank and file that make up our uh, uh, Ministry of Health, for example, that's uh, performed an admirably good job, right? Um, but with that being said, um, institutional capture has uh, been one of those things that's been plaguing Malaysian politics for quite some time. And on that point, I, I don't want to speculate, but it's still in the early days of this new government, so it wouldn't be fair to prejudge them based on anything else. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, so um, we are entering our last um, 10 minutes of the webinar session. So um, I will pass the floor to Calvin for more um, questions from the Q&A box. Okay, so we will continue going down this list. Um, so we'll do two questions. The first is by Rafiq. Um, and Rafiq asks, how do you see the role the U.S. is likely to play having almost ceded the playing field to uh, both Japan and China? So first question. Second question is um, by Ms. Ku. He's asking, um, Dr. Welsh, you speak of curbing of human rights, but would you not agree that one consequence of coping with COVID-19 has been to focus uh, more attention on the right to health, to health care, to education um, in a way never before experienced? So, Surely this would, um, I think, need to respect human rights and all its forms. This is more of a comment. Uh, so it's those two for now. Okay, thanks, Calvin. And thanks, Rafik and Andrew, for two very thought-provoking questions. Um, and Rafik, I think that, uh, that the U.S. is entering, has been in, in uh, an inward-looking period during the Trump administration. One of the points I did not discuss uh, adequately, however, in the presentation, which was in my notes, but it didn't um, uh, time things, I skipped over it, is that it doesn't matter who wins the presidency vis-a-vis -vis the fact that the US-China relationship is going to be very sour. Many people don't appreciate that it is a bipartisan anti-China response. And so the U.S. will continue to serve as a destabilizer um, in terms of the, the great power relationship, uh, I believe. Um, and of course, China will continue to do the same back to the United States. Uh, and this will have ricochet. You know, we're not just talking about a trade war. We're seeing an escalation of this into the South China Sea. I, I think it's going to continue and deepen um, as the process moves forward. Um, I do think, however, that there will be a different, that whoever does win the U.S. election uh, will have uh, a, a little bit of an, uh, a kind of greater awareness of Southeast Asia. So uh, I don't think if, the Trump, if Trump wins, which I think the, at this point it's about a 30% chance in my estimation, um, and, and then there's the, it's too close to call, and then I think there's a Democratic blowout um, in this context. But 30 to 35 percent for Trump winning, uh, uh, you know, if he does win, you're going to see that the, the field, the field completely, as you said, completely seated huh, um, in this context. Uh, and what is going to happen under those circumstances is Southeast Asia will become an arena for the U.S.-China conflict. And it will push Southeast Asian countries more towards China by default um, in this process. In the case of... Um, a more a democratic victory, a Biden victory. Uh, I think there'll still be tremendous inward looking, a focus on the crisis recovery, but at least there'll be a dialogue uh, and that the, yeah, there's at least there's an awareness of Southeast Asia uh, in a, in a way, way that is not just about transactional politics. Uh, and I think that uh, this may offer a kind of uh, a little bit of a buffer 
Uh, but it will not be an easy buffer to win because the U.S. will still be very, I think, very inward looking, uh, dealing with the polarization that it has and the institutional decay that we've seen so far um, uh, within the context of, uh, of the U.S. US politics. Um, and, and, you know, keep in mind that, uh, it may, you know, what we see from outside uh, in terms of, you know, how the U.S. administration is being reported and others, that Trump's support is, is among some of the highest it's ever been during his period of time. And, uh, and I think this reflects some of the same issues that I was speaking earlier about fear and insecurity and how effectively this TV president has been able to galvanize those sens the sentiments um, and, and to, to build on these issues. Uh, in ways that I think it's difficult for people who are outside to understand, uh, but that are but that are very very real, uh, uh, and and I think are not as I said not likely to go away. Now to Andrew's good questions about human rights. I wish you were correct that there was more attention to education and the rights to health care. Um, I think uh, and the right to religion and right to life. I think that. In the early stages of COVID-19, uh, we've seen inclusive strategies and we've seen criticisms to COVID-19 about inclusiveness of, of failing to include rights. And I think you're correct that this has been one important part of the narrative and the experience. Uh, but I think that, that there has also been considerable crackdown across the region in terms of issues of speech, and I also think that one of the, the worries that I have as things move forward is that when resources become more contracted, the choices of who gets what will, and who benefits from these rights of education and, and healthcare will become uh, more frayed, especially as the healthcare systems become more frayed and there are less resources within that. But as you rightly pointed out, and as I was trying to point out earlier, there has also been a polarization uh, within that. There is a large group of people in Southeast Asia across countries who see these rights as very important. They play an important role in terms of setting the narrative and others, even though I would say there still are a minority in these countries, but it's anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of the country. Um, and it's a question of whether or not they can continue to find the interlocutors with government officials to, 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 make, to see that, show that this narrative as a benefit. And it has to be framed not just as in a human rights narrative, but in an economic benefit. So for example, that if you're able to have inclusive health care, then you reduce your own country's health care costs and you don't have this kind of economic impact that the, that the foreign migrant workers has, for example, on Singapore. But I think there, that narrative switch to kind of uh, cannot, combining human rights with economic issues have not necessarily um, come out yet because it's still seen in kind of a we painted things as in a dichotomy. It's like health versus the economy, open up or close. So I think that, uh, that these nuances or these connections have yet to kind of uh, resonate, even though I think many policymakers, uh, especially those in the, uh, recognize them. It's a question of, uh, of building a kind of more integrative narrative uh, where in human rights is seen as included um, and having economic and social benefits that can actually win over uh, the discussion. And we've seen this contested in very interesting ways in different countries across the region. Um, but I think it's still not as, as integrated as, uh, as one would hope for, uh, from a perspective of human rights. Okay, thank you very much for the answers. Um, we are um, closing our Q&A for uh, this session, but before we leave, I was thinking that maybe we can ask the discussant and the speaker to leave um, his or her last thoughts for food for thought for us to process tonight. So, um, Harris, would you like to say a few things to wrap up? Maybe a minute or two each? Yep, sure. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me go first so that Bridget can take all my points. Um, <laughs> um, I think the main idea that I really want to emphasize on today is um, the need for accountability and oversight mechanisms. Uh, we've seen this uh, solely lacking in Southeast Asia today in its responses towards COVID-19. 
And because it's still roughly in the early days, we'll not, we'll not see the uh, adverse effects of the policies that were implemented without parliamentary oversight for, for some time. Right? Um, the thing about human rights is that once it's repealed, to gain progress on it again is going to be incredibly difficult. Um, for example, we see this in um, Malaysia and how we are dealing with uh, uh, the right to assemble, for example. Uh, it's one of the newer democratic norms that came about. Uh, in his start, uh, it, it was there in history, but uh, in recent days uh, with Bersay and even when the Parisan National were in the opposition, they actually utilized the right to assemble quite frequently. Um, but this has been severely impacted by COVID-19. Like the right to assemble is just not feasible due to uh, public health considerations anymore. But we see the norm evolving as well to include uh, what happened over a few weeks ago, I can't remember when, but it was an online protest on Twitter about uh, to fight for migrant rights. So although there's this uh, move to adopt uh, new technology vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, democratic freedoms, um, the lack of oversight in things like uh, fake news laws, for example, in Malaysia is incredibly problematic. And um, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, my minute rambling. Thanks. Okay, Dr. Welsh. Thank you. I'd like to close by first of all thanking ISIS and those people who have had a, uh, who've joined the conversation for listening. And I, well, and I appreciate the comments and questions. I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer all of them. I'd also like to thank Harris for his, for his wonderful contributions and uh, raising a whole set of issues that I think uh, were not only complimented, but also raised things that I had missed out. So I think it's useful to have this conversation. And, 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 and I appreciate, Harris, all you, what you, your, your remarks. Thank I would you. like to close by saying this. Huh? The reality is, is that this is a different type of crisis because of this, the global nature of it and the levels of uncertainty that are global. And I think that you know, there is a sense or a perception among many people that things are gonna go back to normal. And I think the reality is that the way we think about politics, the way we're gonna live our lives and the way we're going to engage and, and understand and even live in the economy is going to shift in very significant ways. Uh, and I think there is probably a bit of denial uh, about what those potential things will be. And it's clearly not going to be an easy process. Huh? Uh, but what we've already seen is, is considerable learning on the parts of some governments, some uh, different levels of responsiveness, levels of ad adaptability. The challenge is, is that there's no clear solution. There's always going to be trade-offs, as there are in all policy. But the problem that is manifested is that the insecurity is so high. Um, and I think what's, what we as public, public intellectuals or commentators or discussions on this, we need to push the envelope to make people start thinking out of their box, using different indicators to measure things, thinking about things in analytically in different sets of ways. And I just hope that today's conversation helps us move us in that direction because we're going to need all of our minds and, uh, and thinking to be able to get through what I think is coming ahead. And thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Welsh, for your input. And thank you, Harris, for your views. Uh, and I would also like to thank our co-moderator, Mr. Kevin Chang, and the whole PACS team for um, making this session a successful one. We've had very positive um, reactions towards this webinar and this will keep us going on for the next webinars to come. And um, I wish um, that um, we all can meet physically soon, uh, may it be in ISIS or somewhere outside in Kuala Lumpur. So I wish you all um, safe journeys and um, hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks. Take care.